Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to Lunch with Books live stream. <clears throat> we are coming to you today, our guest live from Cork, Ireland. And uh, we'll get to Billy in a minute. I just have a couple of announcements. Next Tuesday, the Wheeling Poetry Society uh, series, I'm sorry, continues with Cameron Barnett. He is a gentleman from Pittsburgh. And Mark Harshman, the poet laureate of our state of West Virginia, is the host. And that is March 9th at noon. And on the 16th, my cousin Michelle, who is a lovely singer, and I, and Fair May, the music group, will do a history of Ireland in song and poetry. That is on March 16th, which happens to be my birthday. So feel free to send cake, etc. cetera. Uh, okay, that brings us to today's guest. Like I said, we're all the way from Cork today with Billy O'Callaghan, who was born there in 1974. And he's the author of three short story collections, In Exile, In Too Deep, and The Things We Lose, The Things We Lose, The Things We Leave Behind. I'm sorry, I doubled that up. Uh, he's won several awards. And you can look at his biography on our event page. He has written a, a book called The Dead House. And his latest novel is called My Coney Island Baby, which you can win today. Simply by asking a question of Billy toward the end of our program, you can type your question in any time, and we'll uh, get to those toward the end. But uh, I will draw a winner, and it's signed by Billy. He, he sent his signature from Ireland. I didn't go there to get it, but it's authentic. <clears throat> anyway, to get back to uh, his work, he uh, has a short story collection, which I've read, called The Boatman and Other Stories. And I knew about Billy before I knew about Billy because our friend Stefan Hanvey, who did a show for us live from Finland back in November, is the one who introduced us. But I'd already been reading his work, and it's very fine work. So, uh, like I said, ask a question to win the book. <coughs> Without further eloquence on my part, here is Billy O'Callaghan. Uh, thanks, Sean. Um, hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Billy O'Callaghan, um, and uh, yeah, I'm a, a writer from Cork, uh, which for anyone who doesn't know where Cork is, it's the it's the southernmost county of, of Ireland. It's also the best part of Ireland, um, as anyone from Cork will, will tell you. Um, okay, so I'm, I, I'll talk a little bit more about Cork uh, in a while, but um, because Cork people love to talk about Cork, but uh, I'll, I'm going to read first, and we'll get that out of the way. Um, <clears throat> so I'm going to read uh, two, I'm going to read some, a couple of excerpts from My Coney Island Baby, um, which was published in oh, 2009, 2019, I think. Um, uh, uh, so it's available in, in bookshops. Um, and so I'm going to read uh, a few excerpts from, from this first, and then I'm going to read you a short story from The, the Boatman. Um, <clears throat> My Coney Island Baby is a, is a story about um, two middle-aged people, Michael and Caitlin, uh, who have been, they're married unhappily to other people, um, but they've been meeting uh for 25 years once a month on coney island uh it's it's become their sort of rendezvous and <clears throat> um the, it, this has sustained them in their lives but at the point that the book uh is set uh which is sort of the late 2000s um they've they've reached a kind of a crisis moment in their relationship uh, they've, their Michael's wife is, um, is struggling with cancer and, uh, Caitlin's husband is, is about to receive, um, a big promotion, which will cause her to have to move, uh, to the Midwest. So the things have reached a kind of a crisis point. Um, and so that's where the book is set. But so even though the book takes place over one day, um, a, a winter's day on Coney Island, there are 
uh, several flashbacks to, um, to to give you the sense of who these people actually are. Um, the, the the book isn't trying to um, you know defend or um, justify their behaviour in any way. It's simply meant as a portrait of uh, of of two people's lives. Um, and uh, so I, I'm just going to read um, a couple of well three short samples from the book just to give you a sense of it um, so there's a this piece is from the beginning the air out here is mean with cold it was bitter on the journey out from manhattan too but nothing like this this is bleakness without respite and now we're in an hour in the subway was an hour shielded from the wind and now it is almost noon and already threatening snow Michael and Caitlin walk quickly, side by side, heads lowered, shoulders hunched. Apart from a couple of drunks in a doorway arguing mutedly over a bottle, and further out past Nathan's along Surf Avenue, an elderly black man, leashed by a length of orange clothesline twine to a ridiculously small dog, the streets feel deserted, locked down. Most of the stores along here are shuttered too some closed for the season, others having already written off the day as a bad debt. Passing trade is below freezing. The few places that insist on remaining open, a liquor store, a 7-Eleven, some sort of a goodwill shop with stacks of used spine cracked paperbacks in wicker baskets still out on the window ledges and green plastic sacks of clothing uh, lining the pavement do so more out of stubbornness than duty. Apart from the 7-Eleven, which probably feels contractually obliged, these stories don't bother to burn much, these stores don't bother to burn much light. This afternoon, Coney Island feels like the end of the world, the last bastion just short of some great abyss, a place for the damned to drift, waiting their turn at nothingness. They keep as much as possible to the shelter of the buildings. Words come in clenches, whistling and operatic, but it hurts just to breathe and talking feels even worse. Caitlin holds her coat bunched, closed across her throat in one fist. The wind is strong. The wind is strong enough to pull tears from her eyes. It gusts and swirls around them, tugging at the hem of her overcoat and she is glad that she thought to wear a scarf today, though she could have done with gloves too. Her pockets are deep, but provide barely the suggestion of heat. Snow is forecast, torrents of the stuff, blizzards, but for now it is holding back, except for the occasional spatters that hit like thrown stones and leave imagined bruises in the air and on the skin. The sky above is mud, a bullying slob of grey running into grey, slaughtering detail and definition. Caitlin leans into Michael and they press on at a staggering half run because there is no, there is nothing else to do now that they have started in this direction. So uh, they, they make their way to, um, to a, a hotel um, cheap hotel and uh, the next section comes from from this the room is small but immediately becomes theirs Caitlin enters first and glances round feeding on detail the nape of her neck is shown just for a moment as a white slope before she turns her head again and the loose curtain of casual ponytail falls back into place Michael leans the weight of his body to the door until the lock clicks shut. He delights in watching her, a habit shaped by time, armour against the day she finally slips or is torn from his life. She moves into space towards the bed, absorbing everything of this surround. Her expression rouses a sense of faded youthfulness, her eyes wide and almost scared, her mouth clenched, but not her jaw, her body a straight slender vessel full of so much past. She skirts the bed, 
drifts to the far side of the room, her coat forgotten, inconsequential, dragging behind her in whispers across the cheap nylon carpet. When she moves into the frame of the window, the pale, smoky noon li noontime light transfigures her. The effect is startling. Her skin turns the, the glassy frail of a porcelain screed, slightly translucent, hinting at the branches of bone beneath. And the memory of a dream stirs in Michael's mind, years old and long forgotten, but suddenly real and clear again, and soaked in precisely this same light, one that captured her beside a window much like this one, naked to the waist, but with her hair still with all its young length and fullness, cascading in dark flumes down over her shoulders and small breasts. Standing in profile, head down, she was counting coins, brown pennies, from one hand to the other, and she was weeping. Not too bad, is it? She doesn't turn to look at him yet, and he knows why. No, he says, lying out of duty. Not too bad at all. We've known worse. The room is clean and plain, but determinedly sterile, with all trace of romance having been surgically removed. The sort of room suited to women on the run and travelling salesmen and those who wish to hide a while without being found. Those who need time alone to think of good or even bad reasons why they shouldn't hang themselves in the closet or pull a razor blade across their wrists. But the cold strain of afternoon has added something more. It flushes through the tall, narrow sash window, a blanched, bulky light that thickens the air, melts the surfaces and slows the very turning of the world. And against that, every past and possible future collide with a clap and fuse together. They are held apart by more than distance. Her eyes find him as they find the corners, and the smile, too, is rubbed and far away. Well, she says, I like it. I don't know what it is, but the place speaks to me. I could write here. That's a thought I've not had in a long time, but this air is heavy with stories. Her stillness softens reality. To Michael's eyes, in the moment, she could pass for 25 again, young, pretty, still slim as gathered sticks, the woman of his dreams, for better or worse, smiling but with the sadness that never quite departs her and which always turns him ten kinds of soft. The room, he decides, will be sufficient for their needs, but only because they have carried love in here with them, in them, that and perhaps the peculiar quality of the gifted light. So that's the, um, that's the, that's them arriving in the hotel room. Um, now the, the book uh, deals with uh, quite a bit of the past. Um, the past is as close as the present in the, in the book, um, throughout the book. Uh, Michael, is from Inish Boffin. Um, Caitlin is, is from New York, of, she's of Irish, uh, Irish descent. But um, Michael is from Inish Boffin, which is a small, a very small island off um, Connemara, off the west coast of Ireland. Um, and he left, uh, he left in his late teens, uh, settled in New York and made a life for himself there. Um, but as I say, the, the past never really feels like the past. So I'll just read one last excerpt um, just to give a sense of that. On those mornings after the dreams have come, Barbara brings coffee and sits with her back to the windows, facing the open kitchen door so that she can see through into the hallway, always waiting for something some news from afar, even if it's just a morning paper. Sometimes she hums little snatches of whatever song she has woken with in her mind. And when the stillness becomes too much, she rises again and switches on the radio. It is always the same, a grumbling of static, music jerking in and out of tune, 
and then either a news station or something gentle and innocuous, 60s and 70s hits, but with the volume kept low. They listen, finish their coffee and toast, then reach for bowls and the cereal. These days, they eat muesli. Eggs are high in cholesterol, and bacon has become like a swear word, but muesli is meant to be good for the heart or the bowels or something. The whole thing is farce, shadow play. After the dreams have come and the bones of time have been broken, what is gone feels far more immediate, more enlivened than what tries to count as the here and now. And such mornings fill Michael with the sensation of having been cast adrift. He sips, his, he sips the coffee and quietly digests his breakfast, knowing that he properly belongs nowhere. As good as New York has been to him, he'll never understand the city on a conspiratorial level because he, he was not born for these streets. Barbara, who is full of her own concerns, seems content in leaving him to his silence, but he knows that were she to press him for conversation, his words would come only and ever in Irish. This would probably amuse and then frighten her, and the thought of it frightens him too, because he senses that once he started, there'd be no stopping, that it would be like splitting an artery. He chews the muesli and keeps his eyes open, inhaling with care because the bare stone walls of his father's cottage feel suddenly only a breath away. The small kitchen window coated with the salt and grit of the sea wind and the whistling drafts where the ceiling putty has crusted and turned to powder. If he tries at all, he can feel the heavy wool of an old sweater across his back and shoulders, the thing passed down, the thick shape of it, sagging around him several sizes too big, but its weight comforting against the bleak days, its odour filling his mouth with sooty, slightly gamey sweetness, a familiar taste that itches his tongue and lights a fire deep down in his throat. And when the wind catches just right in the eaves, it can pass almost for the high keening of Anya, his sister, deep in one of the ancient laments she so loved to sing. And it takes nothing at all to imagine her busying herself with collecting breakfast eggs from the small coop or struggling with a slopping pail of water from the communal pump at the bottom of the hill. Inish Boffin is home even still, but the connections to the place are too long lost, the damage irreparable. Sean, his father, dead and buried within a few months of Michael's leaving. Anya also gone. There were the boys, her sons, his nephews, three of them, steps of stairs, but they are grown men now and have themselves long since abandoned the island. They have his address, but none of them have kept in touch, as so often happens. They can't be blamed. They don't know him. He's a name, that's all, a nowhere man and a nobody. Someone they will have heard their mother mention. Someone to look up if they ever happen to find themselves in New York, who can speak if pressed as they do, and who will offer food and a bed, money if needs be. He is nothing to their lives, but even though he only knows them from the flattened expressions of the photographs that Anya used to send every Christmas time without fail, they are in a way everything to him, because they remain the last surviving links to his past, to who he was before he started trying so hard to be someone else. Right, so that's um, that's my Coney Island baby. Uh, it was published by Harper uh, in the US. It was published by Jonathan Cape in, in Britain and Ireland. So um, it, it should be available wherever you have a bookshop open. Um, right, so uh, th that book came out in 2000 and I think it was 19. Um, this book came out last year. It was a collection of short stories, my, my fourth collection, um, The Boatman and Other Stories. Uh, again, it's published by um, Harper. It's Harper Perennial. 
Um, and I'm going to uh, I'm going to read a, a short story, a full short story for you. Um, when when I do readings here in in Ireland, uh, usually we only get to read for about ten minutes or or less sometimes. So it's it's not always easy to to get a full story in. So this is a nice opportunity. Um, I'm going to read um, a story called Wildflowers, <clears throat> excuse me, which was um, which was shortlisted for the um, the Irish Book Award for uh, short story of the year um, last year. So uh, yeah, I'll just I'll start it. It'll take me about twenty five minutes. I'd say. Um, okay, Wildflowers. He came up the hill a little after six. A big man with a soft lumbering gait, worn out from a day that had begun with the dawn milking. A brief but violent late morning downpour had caught him in the fields and soaked him through. And even after seven, several hours spent behind the tractor's wheel, his shirt and jeans remained damp to the touch and warm smelling with the, with the mineral tang of sweat. But because the sun had come out hot enough for a while to scald and settled the whole island with, with the burnished glow of a perfect August evening, his humour, having given way to torpor, was light and easy. Dragging at the air through a smile, he followed the road up between the, the head-high briar ditches, bright on both sides, with blooming fuchsia and honeysuckle, and alive to the bother of wasps, bees, and the occasional flitting greenfinch or babbler. He made the same trips at roughly this time every day, even though his own home lay in entirely the opposite direction. At home, if she'd, al if she'd already finished her day's chores, his wife would be sitting at the table beside the open window, her broad head bent over the crossword puzzles that she never seemed to finish. She'd fill in the short words with fat capital letters, then spend several minutes glaring at the rest of the clues, tapping the butt of the pen against her upper front teeth. When it eventually became clear to her that she'd reached an impasse, her way was to seek a six-letter space, preferably down, because that, for some reason, appealed to her though a cross would suffice in a pinch, and with her usual slow care, she'd spell out her own name, M-A-R-T-H-A. Were he to enter at such a moment, he'd invariably meet a look that seemed equal parts wonder and confusion, as if his appearance, even after 31 years of marriage, still held for her a stranger's surprise. She'd stare eyes big behind the thick round lenses of her bifocals, then return her attention to the page to set about, the uh, set about colouring in the remaining blank squares so that from a distance, if you happen to be colourblind, you might assume the puzzle had been completed. The evening had turned languid and the dead smut of earlier rain of, of earlier rain cloud lingered now only as a memory in the east. Weather for sitting out, he thought, pausing once just where the ditch on his right side broke for a four-rung gate, its iron rusted down to the maroon marrow of old blood. Weather for sipping a glass of cold beer and saving the, eve, the end part of another day well spent. He leaned on the gate's top rung, stopping not because he was out of breath though he was but so that he could savour the spill of the land the misshapen fields empty except for patches of the same measly yellow grass that grew everywhere on the island at this time of year and the dappled blue glass stretch of the ocean as a young man he thought often about the things that must lie on the other side of the horizon line but having fished that water almost from the time he could stand up in a boat without needing to be held, 
the lesson time and tide had taught him was that the sea went on without end, with neither bottom nor sides. Beyond the horizon, there could only ever be more of the same. That saddened him, especially when he saw others go, friends, neighbours, neighbours' children, because their leaving caused him to remember again how he'd had his own heart taken that one time and drowned, and because he'd come to understand that there was nothing to be said, no words of warning that they'd heed. The whispering promises of the surf and the gold and silver that flecked the water's surface were a lure, tempting the curious hearted away from solid footing. But those who took the bait would have to learn for themselves the hard way, the way everybody did. He continued to smile, forcing it now until the sadness receded and the day was again sweet. On impulse, in turning away from the gate, he stooped and plucked some strands of goldenrod and red campion, and as an afterthought, a few wild roses, their white petals blushing a touch pink in places. Then, flowers in fist, he continued up the road, whistling the first airy strains of a tune he knew as the, as the minstrel boy to the cottage set so neatly into a hard sweep of ground that it lay, in, it lay entirely hidden from view until you came within barely five paces of its front door. Hello, he called, pushing his way inside without bothering to knock. The door, as always in hot weather, was ajar. After the sunshine of the hill road, the hallway which led in from the side of the house and divided the tiny building fairly neatly in half, had a gloom that encouraged sighs. To his left, just inside the door, was an immaculately white late edition bathroom, complete with toilet sink and shower that had been converted only in the early 1980s from a small box bedroom and further along another slightly larger bedroom, a shadowy room that across the span of some five generations had known 17 births and probably a dozen final breaths. Hello, he called again, raising his voice a little and feeling its heft out of place in the hallway. Are you here at all? I'm here, an old woman's voice answered after a couple of heartbeats from a head and to his right pitching without effort, though tinged with impatience. I'm still here. She was sitting in the armchair beside the living room's empty fireplace, and he knew at a glance that he'd woken her from sleep. He lingered within the frame of the room's doorway and felt his eyes drawn to the two small windows opposite. The light in here was soft and dull, diffused and made shadowy by the thin fleece of net curtain. There's a nice bit of sun out now, he said. That drop of rain from earlier is after making the evening grand and clean. You should bring a chair outside for an hour. It'd do you a power of good. Was it weeding you were? What? Oh, these. He smiled at the posy of flowers still in his fist. I saw them on the way up and thought they'd brighten the place a bit for you. The ditches are full of colour. A chipped brown vase sat in the centre of the old mahogany folding table, full still with the last bunch of flowers he'd picked some ten days or so ago. Late crocuses, violet and butter yellow, sprigs of bluebell, cerise and lily white foxglove. The, blue, the bluebells were beginning to wilt, but the bouquet as a whole had yet to lose its vibrancy, and instead of replacing or thinning the older blossoms, he simply added the new cuts to the mix. Lazy man's load, she mumbled, watching him from the fireplace. He looked at her, then considered the new display. I don't know, I think they look good, the way they were born to look. You haven't a drop of beer going, I suppose. She flapped a dismissive hand. If you didn't finish what you brought up last week, then there ought to be. You'd know better than I would. He continued to stand there, 
awkward with his size in the middle of the floor, shoulders still slumped. The knuckles of one hand set in a frozen knocking gesture against the table's polished top. His expression looked stuck between thoughts. Well, well what? Is it waiting for me to pour it you are? Go on, it'll be in the pantry if it's anywhere. And sure I'll take a drop too, so if you're having it, half a glass, just just for the taste. I've had the flavour of copper in my mouth all day. It's like I've been sucking pennies. He went through into the pantry, opened the cupboard in the, in the corner and took out two of the small brown bottles from among the five that he'd tucked away the previous Sunday. He twisted off the caps, poured half of one bottle slowly into a tilted glass, then stood watching creamy froth rise from the cloudy golden red liquid. While the ale settled, he drained the remainder of the bottle in a couple of deep, thirsty swallows, then picked up the glass and the second uncapped bottle and returned to the living room. The old woman had closed her eyes again. He stood a moment, then settled across from her in the other armchair. The only sound in the room was the tin stutter of the mantel clock shocking seconds. And because something about the thick, cool seep of the light let him consider her without needing to break down the defence of her own returning stare, he saw, he saw her more clearly than he had in the longest time. I'm not asleep, she whispered after a minute or two, in a voice almost too soft to catch. Don't worry, he said. I have my beer. The faintest hint of a smile tipped the corners of her mouth. I wasn't worried in the least about that. Her face the, this past couple of years had begun caving in around the prod of bone so that everything was becoming juts and hollows, her cheeks beneath their pointed ridges, her mouth beneath her chin, between her chin and the long slender ridge of her nose. As long as he'd known her, she'd been thin, hawkish, she supposed, in the eyes of those who didn't know her softness. But now it seemed as if her bones were shrinking, leaving her skin baked to hide and cobwebbed with creases to sag in a mournful way. Don't stay long. Marta will be wondering where you are. Sure she knows that if I'm not home, I'm either in the fields or up here. She'll not worry. The old woman watched him pull a mouthful of ale from his bottle. Except for the life in her eyes, the focus, she was little more than husk. The glass of beer, still to be tasted, rested on one knee, gripped <clears throat> in her left hand. Its colour deepened by the shadows. Apart from a skin of white foam across its surface, the burnt, glassy brown of amber or old wood. How is she? Ah, she's grand, the same, you know. It hurts her a bit to swallow, and some nights she keeps me awake with, with her whistling. It's the goiter, she says. Her grandmother had it. Plenty of milk then, and periwinkles if she'll eat them. Tell her don't look further than the old cures. <clears throat> He and Marta were, were easy with one another. Love wasn't a word that generally entered into their equation. <clears throat> Though only because there'd been someone else a long time ago and he found it hard to give away again what had already been given once and broken. But then he hadn't been Marta's first choice either. And in time, they'd both come to understand that love wasn't everything. During the first few years, when so much still seemed possible, they made the best of their situation. Having no illusions simplified matters. They were partners sharing, sharing the workload, surviving together. And it was good to have someone. Over the years, they'd learned one another's ways and had each grown comfortable with how the other filled space and affected the silence. Now, more than half a lifetime on, they rarely argued anymore, and routine gave them not only balance, but an identity. 
sometimes more so during the early years of their marriage, but occasionally even still lying awake in the small hours, each of them listening to the raw to the hushed draw of the other's breathing. It was easy to give in to the thoughts that kept them lit. And lovely in such moments to take her in his arms and to let himself be guided in a way that met both their needs. The heart wants what it wants, but will often learn to settle for what it can get. He hit the bottom of his bottle unexpectedly and his thirst remained unquenched. There was beer left in the pantry, but the room's reverie was such that it didn't feel quite right to move. And so he remained in his armchair, gripping the bottle and trying to enjoy the coolness of its glass against his, pal his calloused palm. Across from him, the old woman's eyes were slipping relentlessly shut. Every few minutes she struggled to revive herself, only to be soon or quickly dragged back down, dragged back down under another wave of drowsiness. I'm sorry. She cleared her throat and stirred a little. It's this weather. It has me beat. I can't seem to keep awake. You're lucky, he said. I haven't slept properly in weeks. There's too much light out. And with Marta gasping for air alongside me, I can only lie there watching the window for the dawn. And I get to thinking, you know, about all kinds of things. That's the worst of it. I tell you, it makes the short nights feel very long. A fresh wave of sleep broke and this time threatened to drown her. She went under and remained there, down at the bottom. In the armchair, she looked very small. Her feet, he noticed, tucked into square-toed shoes, the leather colour of bog turf and with steel buckles that had years since lost their sheen, barely reached the linoleum. Nothing moved, and he found himself leaning forward in, ser in search of some hint, however slight, that would signal the continuance of life. The way he and Marta had taken turns with, with the infant Michael all those years earlier, not that it had made any difference in the end, because nights always kept a part of themselves hidden, and even if you succeeded in remaining awake, there were still oceans worth of things that got missed. He stared at the old woman and for a while there was nothing to see but skin like tree bark and long silky wisps of hair whitened to translucence by the spill of light from the nearest window. And then her mouth clenched and her tongue flashed across her lower, her thin lower lip. I dreamed of your father, she said, all night long. I closed my eyes and there he was, the way he always was of a morning after getting the fire lit, in his shirt sleeves and braces, his cheeks and chin dirty with a night's stubble. He turned on the wireless and we danced around the room, just like when we were first married, slowly, hardly moving, I feeling small and safe in his arms, his body strong as a reef inside his clothes. I knew the whole time that it wasn't real, but it was so vivid, I could smell the oil of his skin and I didn't want it to ever end. When I finally woke, I wept because my mind had carried his voice in whispers back through into the morning with me. It's just a dream. We all have them, even ones like that. I suppose, but they can leave such a mark. Honestly, I haven't been right all day. She shook her head and noticing the glass of beer lifted it to her mouth and sipped. Froth clung to her lip and the tip of her nose. Can't you go, boy? Marta will have a crust on your dinner trying to keep it warm. He sighed. All right, I suppose I better. But sure, I'll be up along tomorrow and Marta will give a call in the morning. Is there anything you need at all? Nothing for you to be fretting about. He hesitated, then stood, stepped close to her and kissed her cheek. Her skin was cool and rough, not as he remembered. Bye, ma'am, 
he whispered against her ear. She closed her eyes again, and the smile deepened on her mouth. Bye, love. Don't forget to tell Marta what I said about the periwinkles. Tell her I said my boy is lucky to have the likes of her, even if he doesn't always know it. Outside, the evening seemed brighter than before, golden and lazily alive, clotted with bird song. The sky now was clear of cloud from age to age, and the warm mottled turquoise of a blackbird's eggs. He started back down the road. The slope made walking easy at first, but the gradual accumulation of gravity soon began to feel like a hand against his back. And, and wherever the stretch turned particularly steep, he had to fight to keep from quickening into a run. To his right, wherever the ditches broke or dropped below eye level, he caught sight of the sea glittering in the sunlight. The blueness made him think again of Hannah. He'd li she'd lived on the other side of the island, the land side, and at 15 and for a couple of years that followed, before taking the boat to the mainland, then to England, and from there to who knew where, she'd never missed an opportunity to hold his hand. He remembered her hair jagged as wind, and her heavy lidded eyes, the Spanish colour of, of a burnt dirt that clenched shut in laughter, and for the better part of their teenage years, they'd walked together, danced in fields, kissed whenever they thought no one was looking traded hopes and secrets and made the best and most of any hidden places they could find. She left the way so many did and once all hope of a return was lost, gone became the same as dead. But the ghosts lingered. The sight of the sea on a good day always made him recall her with a mixture of wonder and the old sadness and if the bad days tended to heavily outweigh the good, then there were still there was still usually an hour or five minutes or a single heartbeat during which the sun would seep into view and keep memories alive, and there was the constancy of the water, the waves pulling towards the land to smash against the rocks and shore. Without thinking, he dropped to his haunches and began to pluck more wildflowers. Bees scurried around the foxgloves, so he gathered whatever came to hand, harebell, columbine, cowslip, spools of honeysuckle, sweet violet. At home there'd be a dinner waiting on a plate, potatoes, cabbage, maybe a bit of mutton, and a bottle of something sweet to drink, cooling in a water bucket in the shade, and Marta. On days like this he had no appetite, though it would be nice to sit outside and wait for the light to fade. She'd wonder about the flowers, but wouldn't remark on them, except to smile. And if he kissed her, she'd kiss him back, probably laughing as they came together. In another month, he'd turn 50. And when he closed his eyes, it was as if the years had meant nothing in their passing. He could tell himself and believe that he was who he had always been in one breath an old man, in the next still very much a boy, and he kept his lasses close because time's barriers were soft. Okay, so that, that was wildflowers. Um, right. Uh, uh, how can we go from here? Um, I suppose if there's questions or... Oh, there's a pile of questions. Okay, I'll try. Yeah, I'll jump in here for a second. Yeah, please do. Yeah. Um, so, you're from Cork. Yeah, from Cork. Does it, um, does it influence your writing? Tell us about Cork. Uh, yeah. Well, uh, I'm I'm from Cork. Um, for for people that that don't know, Cork is a is a is an old place. Um, Cork was settled first in um it was a monastic settlement in the back in the sixth century so so a long a long time back um the vikings came during the 900s and extended the settlement um and in 
1185, we received uh, our city status. Uh, the, the Cork was chartered as a city. Um, the reason I remember the date was because we had the 800th anniversary in 1985, and there was lots of celebrations. Um, so, so yeah, so the city as as it as it is now is is, is pretty old. Um, certainly, it's old by American standards. Um, but uh, yeah, I, I come from a, a village just on the the edge of the city um, called Douglas, um, and uh, Douglas is. Uh, when when I was a child, it, it was it was much more rural than it is now. It's it's really been swallowed up by the city. But it was um, it was a, a rural sort of a place, um, you know, that in between area, um, and it was a great place to grow up. It was it, it still had a sense of being a city of a, a village, um, and it, it was it was lovely to grow up there. Um, as to whether the Douglas and and Cork um, influences my writing. I, it absolutely does. Um, my latest book, which was just published um, a few weeks ago here, uh, is called Life Sentences. Um, and it's a, it's a family saga. It's based on my own family history. Um, my, my grandmother, who was my mother's mother, her father, and his mother. So it, it, it covers a span of time from just after the famine, um, so the kind of 1850s, up through to 1982, where the, the book ends. Um, and it's based on stories that my grandmother told me, um, memories of, of her father that she had and her grandmother. Um, it's I mean it's a combination of of research and you know uh, stories that were passed down, um, and the the story is told the book is told in three parts three first person narratives um, so each of them get a turn to speak and tell their story, um, and I I when I was a child. Um, I lived with my grandmother, so we had her in the house, and she she was um, she was a storyteller. She would keep me at home from school to tell me stories and um, filled my head with, you know, story tales of the fairies and the banshee and the black and tens and all that sort of stuff. Um, she told me a lot about her own childhood growing up in in Douglas Village. Um, and she told me a lot about her father, uh, who had been um, a soldier. Uh, he, he had been in the, the Boer War and then in the First World War. Um, and the, this novel is, is set in, in Douglas Village, but it, it begins its journey um, from West Cork. Um, who, my great great grandmother, you know, just after the famine, she moved up to the city. Uh, in search of work and in search of a, some kind of a life um, when the famine had devastated, you know, that area, um, particularly that area. I mean, it was uh, it, it was a wipeout um, between the, the amount of people who died and the um, and the immigration. So um, she made her way up to Cork and and the that's that's the um, the the foundation, I suppose, of that book. Uh, so absolutely, I would say that um, the place uh, the place has influenced my writing. Um, it's the place I know best. Um, and it's, uh, you know, like Douglas is a place that has become very built up um, in, in recent years. Uh, the Celtic Tiger, you know, did a lot of uh, a lot of good for the country, but it it took away a lot of the character of, of smaller places. Um, but when you know when I when I when I close my eyes, I can see I can still see the the village as it was when I walk around the place. I, I you know I I'm, it's like as if I'm seeing two villages: the one that's there now and the one that 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 it's built on, if you like. Um, 
and so uh you know it, it just feels a very natural thing for me to write about um so yeah uh, does that answer that yes, it does. Thank you very much. uh so we can call for, uh o'callaghan country like well funnily you should say that now because uh, actually life sentences is my mother's branch of the family but um there is a part of of Cork uh, down around um, it's Mallow, uh, which is sort of North Cork. Um, that's that that was always known as O'Callaghan country, and it was where my father's people uh, originated from. Um, uh, and it's um, it was it was where the clans, you know, I mean, we were we were a, a, I suppose a clan society, and and that was where the O'Callaghans were were based. Um, and they were there for hundreds of years. They 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 only scattered when Cromwell forced them to scatter. Um, but even even at that, he he only uh, he only bothered about the um, the chieftains, the the sort of the royal element of each clan. He left the peasant class there. So. Um, so that's how we survived, yeah. uh, and actually, like in that area, it's every second person you meet will be an O'Callaghan. So, nice. still, it's still O'Callaghan country, I think. And uh, we'll get to the questions from the audience, but yeah. I just wanted to mention you and I talked before. Uh, there's a Wheeling connection, and I told you North Wheeling was known as Corktown, and you told me about a. Uh, uh, is it a Caribbean island? Yeah, it's a, it, there's an island in the Caribbean where um, there were uh, a lot of Cork people. They were they were heading to South America or somewhere, and they um, they got off at a Caribbean island, and I, I just can't for the life of me remember which one. I think it might have been Saint Martin or one of these places, and you know a couple of hundred, and they stayed and infiltrated the place, um, and. Uh, you know, 150 years later or however long, um, everybody there now has a Cork accent. Um, so, you know. Here's a question from CJ Farnsworth. Have you spent time in the Coney Island area? If not, how do you approach researching setting? How important is establishing authenticity of setting? Right, well, um, I visited Coney Island once uh, very briefly, just for an afternoon, many years ago. Um, but it was a place that had always, you know, I had an image of it in my mind um, from films. And uh, it, 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 when I when I started writing the book, it, it sort of decided itself that it was going to be set there. Um, what I had in mind when I was writing it, because the book is really um, uh, almost like a fairy tale, you know. I mean, who continues an affair for twenty-five years? You know, that's that's fantasy stuff anyway. So, um, so I wanted I wanted a place that would be sort of larger than life in your imagination. Um, uh, I had read. Um, I had read the the Ferlinghetti poem, Coney Island of the Mind, many years ago. Um, uh, Lawrence Ferlinghetti, the, the the poet, he died only last week. I think he was a hundred and something or yeah. ninety something. Um, but I had, uh, you know, it wasn't so much the poem as the title that had lingered with me because I had a, a place in my mind that was was more vivid and more alive than the. Than the reality, um, setting is very important uh, to me. Um, and when I write the the when I write my books and when I write my stories, I want the setting to to feel as as vivid and visceral as, as possible. Um, but you know, it's the a place can be more can be more vibrant in your mind than in in the reality i think um and that that's how it was for me because when i went to coney island it was it was nice and i enjoyed it but 
it, it wasn't it, it didn't measure up to the Coney Island of of my imagination. Um, I know this was years before I started writing the book. Um, this was back in the uh, I, maybe the early two thousands or, or late nineties. Um, but um, so uh, yeah, that one was a bit of um, was an anomaly because usually I, I like to set my stories in places that I know very well um that I, I can I, I know without having to think about them. Um in in this one the 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 place is is almost a metaphor in some ways because it's um you know I wanted it to to be I wanted to choose a place that was first of all that was you know past its it had its golden days and now it was gone beyond it. And that mirrored the couple who, who, you know, had um, developed their paunches and, you know, they'd, they'd, they'd lost their, um, the, the, the best of themselves maybe. Uh, so there was that. And then I also wanted an island, you know, Coney Island may not strictly be an island, but um, I wanted one to play off in Ishbafen. So I, I wanted that sort of one to play off against the other. So so that was the reason that um, that I chose Coney Island. Okay. Very good. <clears throat> uh, someone wants to know. If, uh, well, here's the question. Or what was it to inspire? Okay. Um, okay. Uh, um, I would say. I would say it was probably my grandmother. It was it was probably listening to those stories by the fire. Um, you know, anything that kept me home from school was was welcome. Um and uh she she lit a lit a fire in me, I think. Um and when when she died, I I I, I really turned to books to replace that. Um, and you know we live close to the library as well, so I, you know I was running back and forth to the library, and um, and that that was it really. Um, once I started writing, I mean it was for a long time. I I, I was always a, a big reader, but I, I never thought that writing was something that that I could do. That you know I, I thought it was for you know highly educated special people and um i I've, I've come to realize that all you really need to to do is be able to tell a story and to love love reading because it's it, it's from reading that you learn how to write you learn you know you, you learn how to develop characters and you know structure your plot and all of that sort of thing um when i when i the, the writers that i first loved to read um and the ones that that I probably still have as a kind of a benchmark would be people like um, John Steinbeck um, and Hemingway, um, Ray Bradbury when I, you know when I was younger as well, um, and uh, there was different aspects of them of of their work that really just appealed to me. Um, so they were they were the ones that that I, I that you know that really first gave me the the. Um, the drive maybe to to write um and then i found you know great writers along the way um people like i don't know if you if, if you're familiar with somebody like john benville you know great irish writer i mean he he's the master of language he he uh, you know him and maybe john updike um the american writer uh they, they were two that that really set the bar for me you know so when i was writing those were two that i was i was sort of aiming for um so yeah that's 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 the answer to that question okay good uh one more question and then we'll yeah okay uh um it's a good question um that's yeah, you know, uh, the, the more so, more increasingly, uh, I think um, my work is is becoming much more personal. Um, it's it's drawn from my own experiences. Um, in terms of uh, 
you know, not strictly the way I write them, but the, the feeling behind them. Um, when I was uh, when I was writing my Coney Island baby, you know, I, I didn't have a, a 25 year love affair. Um, uh, that, that wasn't, you know, it, it wasn't a, oh, it wasn't autobiographical in that sense, but it, it was in the sense that the, the thing that that drove me to, to to want to write the book or to that I was trying to make sense of in writing the book was um, I had met somebody and we were trying to make sense of a, a long term, a, a long distance relationship. Um, and so I, I decided that the characters could meet once a month over a period of time and that they wouldn't see each other in between. And that was that was really my way of trying to make sense of rationed um, meetings. Uh, different aspects of, of life frequently do come into the into the stories. Um, uh, I seem to write a lot about um well i don't write a lot about it but i i it's it's it comes up time and again in my work i think is um uh children that have died are babies um and when i when i was young um i had a brother who who died as a baby um after you know i think um four months or something like that and um and that that was you know I, I i i find myself thinking a lot about that when i'm writing these things and so I, I do wonder about how much of the the work is shaped subconsciously you know and it's trying to figure out you know ways not necessarily to to find answers for these things but ways to kind of um you know deal with them and carry on with them you know carry them forward um, that's that's probably a, one of the the main themes in in my writing is 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 how people overcome difficulties, hardships, um, you know, sometimes terrible things that have happened to them, and how they find the strength to pick themselves up and and keep going because that's all that's all you can do. But that's you know it's still it's still um, heroic to do it, um, and. Uh, so that's the, I, I I think I write about the things that that keep me lying awake at night thinking about you know um, the concerns that I have in my own life they get worked out in stories not directly but sort of indirectly um, and uh, as for writing about ordinary people well you know who else would you want to write about. Um, you know, I, I, I have no interest in writing about a film star or, a, um, you know, the, those those lives to me aren't real. Um, I, I, you know, I, I, I think it's what I can relate to. Um, and, you know, 99.999% of the world is is ordinary people. So that's uh, that's why that's probably why. Thank God for that. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Well, yeah. Billy, uh, thank you very much for joining us today. We're uh, against it here in the, on terms of time, but I appreciate your thoughtful answers and your uh, delightful reading. Um, I could listen to you read all day. Thank you very much. And uh, someday I hope to have a beer with you and Stefan when the public open again. That'd be fun. Well, yeah, won't it? We'll uh, we'll give away this copy of my Coney oh. Island baby. I'm going to draw a name from the people who ask questions, and there are more questions we didn't get to. So if you want to look at Facebook, you can feel free to answer. Uh, but the winner of the book is C.J. Farnsworth, who did uh, ask our first question. So C.J., if you'll send me your uh, mailing address and an email or on a message, I'll uh, get that out to you right away. Thanks. Great. Again. Next week, Cameron Barnett Wheeling Poetry Series. Thanks, everyone who attended. We'll see you next time. Bye.